At a facility called the Vertical Self-Management Center, there's a very particular prison. There are 333 floors with a hole in the middle, and food is lowered on a platform. Prisoners have two minutes to eat as much as possible before the platform leaves to the next floor. The lower they are, the fewer chances they have of eating anything. If anyone tries to keep food for later, the administration will punish them. Each month, the administration shuffles the prisoners and sends them to different floors. Each prisoner is also allowed to come with one object of their choice. Somewhere hidden in this building, kids are playing on a strange pyramid. Before being sent to their cells, the prisoners are interviewed and asked for their favorite dish, which will be added to the food selection on the platform. Zimutin asks for pizza and explains he may get nervous if he doesn't get it every day, like the time he set his parents' house on fire while they were asleep. However, the interviewer knows Zimutin immediately regretted starting the fire with his own autobiography and put it off. Meanwhile, Perimpuan says her favorite food is the ham croquettes his ex used to make for her, and that she's joining the facility because she needs time to forget what she did. Eventually, Zamiatin and Perempuan end up on level 24. When the Zamiatin checks the platform for his pizza, he's devastated to see people have taken bites and stolen the toppings. Arguments coming from above reveal that the prisoners from level 21 ate food that wasn't theirs. Furious, Zamiatin grabs some chicken and is about to bite it, but he's interrupted by Robespierre and his cellmate from level 23. It turns out that a group of prisoners is following a self-imposed rule that says each person can only eat the dish they chose during the interview or trade with others voluntarily. That way, everyone gets fed without exceptions. Those who follow that rule are known as loyalists, and those who don't are called barbarians. Robespierre points out that if Zemitin eats something else for revenge, it'll create a ripple effect and leave the bottom levels without food. Zamiatin doesn't care and is about to take a bite, but Perempuan stops him by sharing her croquettes. The next day, the prisoners from level 21 get angry over the rules, and Robespierre announces they may have to fight for their food. Perempuan immediately breaks her bed to get a metal bar she can use as a weapon. By the time the platform reaches her level, there already is a dead man on it. Then Robespierre and a guy from 21 fall on top of it, while a woman from above keeps kicking off the food that fell on her level, not wanting to be punished for a mistake. However, her level is already heating up, and soon she catches on fire, causing her body to fall on the platform as well. While Robespierre and the other man keep on fighting, Perempuan puts the fire out with her bedsheets. However, the woman is already dead. Then she tries to join the fight, only to quickly be brought down, while the man from 21 is knocked out. At that moment, the platform starts going down, so Perempuan and Robespierre rush to throw into the pit all the food that fell on their level. The temperature starts falling at great speed, but thankfully they get rid of all the food before they're frozen to death. After the platform is gone, Robespierre freaks out and cries as he realizes the burned woman is dead. Zimiatin tries to comfort him, and Robespierre snaps, grabbing him by the neck. Perempuan has to yell at them to stop them. The unconscious guy from 21 is tied up, and Robespierre announces he'll take the body down the levels to look for the anointed ones. Zimiatin doesn't understand, so Robespierre shares the story. Some time ago, there was a man who became known as the Master, or the Messiah. He was the one that came up with the fair distribution rules, but nobody knows if he's still alive or if he ever truly existed. The Master sent a message of hope, saying he survived a whole month on a low level without eating by meditating. The following month he woke up at the very bottom where food never reached, so he chose cannibalism and fed the needy with his own leg. Those who ate the Master's flesh are the Anointed Ones, and since then they've spread the Master's message of solidarity. Zemitin doesn't believe the story, and yells that he hasn't eaten in two days before the lights go out. Robespierre ignores the mocking and throws the burned woman's body into the pit. 
As it falls, it hits the edges of the different levels, and the body starts breaking. Eventually, all the pieces land on the bottom, where cannibals grab them to feed. The next day, the platform brings the pizza Zamiton wanted, and he finally gets to eat. Robespierre eats his dish and throws the food of dead prisoners in the toilet. He explains that arbitrary leftover distribution only favors a small few and would only cause more fights and violence. Then Robespierre assigns a few dishes for Zimiatin and Perempuin to protect before leaving on the platform with the prisoner. Days start to pass, and Zimiatin and Perempuin eat their own dishes. They throw away the leftovers to avoid trouble, but when nobody is looking, Zamiatin eats a bit as well. Each day the duo grows closer, and they start helping each other with intimate things like grooming and sharing their food. To keep herself busy, Perempuin doodles on the wall by scratching it with razors. On the last day of the month, Perempuin invites Zamiatin to draw something on the wall too. However, he says he's more of a science guy and has dedicated most of his life to studying math. Zamiatin writes an equation on the wall and explains it made him quit because the solution is an imaginary number. He'd concluded that if they accepted something without a physical reality as a correct solution, then he couldn't trust math again. That day, he left his job at the university, his research, and abandoned his family to go back to his parent house. Later that night, they hear that the food reached level 175, which never happened before. Everyone starts celebrating, and Perempuin asks Zamiatin to dance with her. After some hesitation, he agrees, and they have fun together. The next day, Zamiatin and Perempuin are horrified to wake up on level 180. When the platform arrives, it has no food at all. Days pass, and the duo has to suffer through their hunger. Once again, Perempuin draws on the walls to keep herself distracted. Zimiton's chosen object is a lighter, and he keeps using it to burn his clothes just for fun. Eventually, he starts getting burns on his skin too, and Perempuin has to stop him. Suddenly, Zimiton vomits tons of blood, revealing he's sick. At the same time, a head falls through the pit. Voices from above announce that some anointed ones are going through the levels to kill barbarians. Days continue to pass, and Perempuin concentrates on taking care of Zamiatin, while people below them are starting to look scrawny. Body parts keep on falling down the pit too, it seems the anointed ones are still fighting. Messages come from above saying they're getting closer, and there's a list of barbarians they want to catch, including a fat man from 24 who ate food belonging to the dead. To protect her partner, Perempuin says they used to be in level 74. That night Zimiton thinks about the interview. He did try to say he came to the facility because people were afraid of him, but the interviewer knew the truth. Zimiton dropped out of school at 16. All his business ideas failed, his wife and kids kicked him out, and even his parents got sick of him. They sent him to the facility so he could get some discipline. Deciding he has nothing left to live for, and that Perempuin shouldn't be punished for protecting him, Zamiatin uses his lighter to self-delete. Perempuin cries as she watches his body fall into the pit. People on the lower floors try to catch him hoping for meat, but the flames almost hurt them too, so they let go. The body lands at the bottom and the cannibals wait for the fire to go out before eating. At the beginning of the new month, Perempuin wakes up on level 51 with Natalia, who chose plums as her food and a pillow as her object. She's also missing an arm. When the platform comes, the plums are missing, but Perempuin convinces Natalia to follow the rules. At night, Perempuin hallucinates Zimiatin in the room with her. Sometime later, a head falls down the pit, and the women learn that an anointed one known as Dagon Bobby is killing barbarians all over the place. The rules say that only the prisoners directly above the level with a barbarian should go down to punish them, but the next time the platform comes down, Natalia still jumps on it to join the fight. Eager to avenge Zamiatin, Perempuin decides to come along. As the platform goes down, 
more and more prisoners agree to join their cause. Eventually, they reach a level with a barbarian called Oscar, who attacks first and stabs a person on the platform. A vicious fight ensues that leaves everyone bleeding and bruising. After lots of punches and kicks are exchanged, Oscar pretends to surrender, only to jump on the platform when it's about to leave. A furious Natalia jumps too and starts beating him up. So Oscar brings her down and gets ready to stab her. At that moment, Perempuan lands on the platform as it stops on the next level. While Perempuan rescues Natalia, another prisoner jumps on Oscar and starts choking him. Unfortunately, the man gets stabbed as well, so Perempuan cuts in to start beating him up again. Oscar begins to cry and explains he didn't do anything wrong. He's been in the facility for over a year and had to eat something to recover. He only wants to survive like everyone else. Perempuan takes pity on him and lets him escape on the platform, blocking Natalia when she tries to stop him. That night, Natalia explains she's been in the facility for six months. When she arrived, her cellmate explained the rules, and she agreed to follow them, even if she didn't find them fair. But sometime later, they found a dying young man and gave him a dead prisoner's food to save him. The following day, Deg and Bobby came to punish them. She took Natalia's arm and killed her cellmate by strapping her to the bottom of the platform, letting the cannibals at the end of the pit eat her. That day, Natalia realized nobody ever leaves the facility, and survival is an illusion. The only way to live is by escaping, and Natalia thinks it can be done when the prisoners are gassed and moved around during the end of the month. If they can fake their deaths, then their bodies will be thrown out of the facility by administration instead. Natalia believes she can do it by eating the oil painting a prisoner brought as their item, but she doesn't know what level it's on. A few days later, they see a man tied to the bottom of the platform. This means Dag and Bobby and his group are getting closer, so Natalia convinces Perempuan to go down to avoid them. Unfortunately, at that moment, the platform stops bringing Dagon Bobby and his followers. At first he pretends to be generous and lets them eat something, but as soon as the platform leaves, Dagon makes some of his people capture Natalia, Perempuan, and those who went down with her to fight the other day. Dagon offers a long speech about how people must obey the law, not interpret it. Making exceptions is just an excuse to be disloyal, and he reveals he's missing his eyes, as if that proved his point. Then the group undresses Natalia and ties her to the bottom of the platform to be sent to the cannibals. Perempuan is held down with her arm extended over the pit, so when the platform goes down, it rips it off. Meanwhile, in the mysterious room, the kids continue to play as they appear to multiply. The next month, Perempuan wakes up on level 72, and meets her new cellmate, Tramagasi, whose object is a knife. His being alive reveals this story happens before the first movie. When the platform arrives, Tramagasi eats without following the rules. Perempuan has given up on this unfair justice and jumps on it, inviting Tramagasi to come along. As they go down, Perempuan convinces more barbarians to join her, including Oscar. There are so many people who hate the loyalists that soon the platform is pretty crowded. A few levels later, Perempuan announces their group is big enough, and they get off the platform. It's then revealed that the infamous painting is in that cell, and finding it had been Perempuan's objective all along. Recruiting fellow barbarians had only been a way to gain protection. The next day, Deg and Bobby make sure to empty the platform before it reaches the level with Perempuan's group. He explains he'll wait for them to be weak to attack and kill them, but he'll consider mercy if they surrender now. An argument ensues on how to proceed, and some barbarians leave for the lower levels. Suddenly, Tremagasi interrupts the argument with an idea. They should all go down and eat any loyalists they find. The group loves the idea, and while they celebrate, Perempuan remembers sharing her story during the interview. She used to be an important artist, and the painting Natalia had been looking for had been her object all along. 
Her fiance had a child from another marriage, and Perempuan had accidentally killed him. The next time Perempuan wakes up, she tastes meat in her mouth. She's been refusing to eat human flesh, but she became very scrawny, so a lady fed her to help her recover. Seeing hallucinations of all her fallen friends, Perempuan has no choice but to start eating the meat the barbarians offer her. Sometime later, the platform is approaching, and while everyone is getting ready to fight, Perempuan hides the painting in her pants, which is noticed by Oscar. The platform arrives with a bunch of mattresses that suddenly fall, revealing Degan Bobby and his group of loyalists, who immediately attack. A vicious fight begins, and both sides start killing opponents without mercy, covering the entire place in blood. It becomes difficult to see who is who, and Trimagasi accidentally stabs a woman he had a crush on. Traumatized, he decides to stop fighting and hides under the bed. Meanwhile, Oscar sits on top of Perempuan and starts choking her. Trimagasi notices this and hands her his knife, which she uses to stab Oscar. He dies after asking why the painting was so important. Then she moves to hide with Tremagasi and cries while the prisoners continue to kill each other. Even Dagon Bobby goes down, and in the end nobody is left alive except for Trimagasi and Perempuan. When the platform goes down, the bodies start falling into the pit. Perempuan comes out and notices Dagon Bobby is still breathing, but she decides not to kill him so he can suffer until the end. Afterward, Perempuan throws all the remaining bodies down the pit, leaving a now dead Dagon for last. She tells Tremagasi she's leaving and asks him to come along, but he decides to stay, saying this was the best month of his life. Then Perempuan starts eating her oil painting and passes out with foam in her mouth right before the gas fills the cell. In the mysterious room, a whole pile of children is struggling to climb up until a boy makes it to the top. At that moment, a light shines on him, and two adults from administration arrive to take him away. When Perempion wakes up, she's tied to a pile of dead bodies being moved by facility workers, meaning Natalia's plan worked. The pile is pushed through the pit, and Perempion gets to see how the workers clean the cells and rearrange the sleeping prisoners using low gravity. When the workers leave the pile at the end of the pit, Perempuan has a devastating realization. This isn't the exit, this is level 333. She immediately wriggles free from the rope and hides under a bed while watching the men bring in the chosen kid. The boy is left on another bed, and the pile of bodies is pushed through a hole into a secret level lower under 333. Still feeling guilty for killing her fiance's kid, Perempuan decides to cleanse her consciousness by saving this one. She jumps to reach the other bed, only to accidentally hit her head. Then she picks up the kid and tries to leave, but the gravity is still a problem and causes her to hit her head again until she passes out. Perempuan reappears on the platform with the kid in the middle and a bunch of cannibals ready to eat. A man gives her a knife inviting her to feed on the child, but at that moment she wakes up screaming. It's just her and the boy in level 333, and the platform soon takes them down to the very dark bottom. Soon the cannibals surround her, but they don't attack her because of the child. They explain Perempuan must stay because her journey is over, and only the children get to go back up again. The cannibals help Perempuan get off the platform and watch how it starts going up again, taking the kid to new prisoners. As time passes, more and more prisoners arrive at the bottom on top of the platform, carrying a child. It seems the facility keeps a bunch of kids as a tool to manipulate the prisoners, using them as a fake sign of hope or to stop anyone from trying to escape. This includes the ending of the first movie, showing Goring arrive with a girl while seeing a hallucination of Trimagasi. Goring gets off the platform, so the girl can go up again. At that moment, Perempuan finds Goring and hugs him, revealing he was her fiance, 